While visiting with Francois the place where the mighty Tyrus once towered above the sea, I stood amazed about the accuracy of Bible prophecies. The runes is witness of a prophecy fulfilled many ages ago. Francois will now take us on a trip to this interesting place in Lebanon. These people can hardly believe what their eyes are beholding. They are looking at the remains of some of the largest heathen temples of antiquity. This is where the Romans and Greeks used to reign. The Persians, the Babylonians and the Assyrians preceded them, of course. Today we are visiting an archaeological area that stretches from the north of Syria down to the narrow coastal strip to the Bay of Accra, called Phoenicia. This Greek name, Phoenicia, is related to one of its principal exports, a purple-coloured material called phoenix, which means purple or crimson. However, the people who lived here called themselves Canaani. Does that ring a bell? Canaanites. And what did they call their country? They called their country Canaan. It's a great experience to visit these biblical sites like Sidon. Here you're looking at the Tower of Sageta at Sidon, which dates from the time of the Crusaders. We read in Judges 10 verse 6 that the people of Israel adopted the idolatrous worship of the gods of the Sidonians. You're looking at the relief of the famous god Baal. Judges 10.7 tells us that once the Israelites adopted this heathen religion, the Sidonians oppressed them. While visiting here, I thought of Mark 3.8, where it says that the people of Sidon heard about Jesus and walked all the way to Galilee to listen to his beautiful messages of salvation. Another interesting place in ancient Phoenicia is Sarafant, as the Lebanese call it today. Do you remember the biblical name? Zarephath. The prophet Elijah visited here and asked the widow for bread, but she said she only had enough to make her last meal and then die of hunger. Come with me to one of the most important cities of ancient Phoenicia. The modern Lebanese name is Jebel, the biblical name is Gebal, and the Greek name is Byblos. Please take your pick. In the foreground you see the ruins of the ancient Phoenician civilization. The pillars in the background date from the Roman period. Whenever you see these cultic pillars in the ancient world, there is a strong possibility that you will also find a high place of sacrifice. Let's look around. And here we find it. People, I want to tell you that you're looking at something which represents the cruelest act of antiquity. Humans were sacrificed on this high place of sacrifice. When you read about the cruelty of the ancient Phoenicians and the debasing sensual religion they practiced, you can appreciate the fact that God allowed them to destroy themselves. I told my daughter and her friends in this sarcophagus at Byblos that God has placed within man the need to worship. The devil knows this and he exploits this basic human need and offers us a selfish, perverted way of worship in order to destroy us. Let us worship God on his terms and be on the safe side. The Phoenicians of Byblos imported the raw papyrus plant from Egypt like the one you see here. After they processed it, they exported the papyri finish, a kind of writing pad, to the nations of antiquity. This is a sample of what the papyri looked like. This specific fragment comes from the Elephantine island in Egypt and was written in 500 BC. Because Byblos was the world supplier of writing materials, scholars decided to name the Bible after Byblos. Let's move on to the next important Phoenician city. Please excuse my poor photography, but this slide has great historical value to me. It was here at the ancient site of Tyre that my love for archaeology was born in May 1966. During low tide, you see these interesting ancient runes protruding from the Mediterranean Sea. How did they get thrown in here? This is an amazing story. The cuneiform records tell us that the Phoenicians called Tyre Ushu. The Greeks, however, called it Palaetiros. The ancient city was built on the mainland on the narrow Phoenician coastline. 
One kilometer off the mainland, there used to be an island that the Phoenicians used as a harbor. I'll do some more explanation in a minute. The earliest reference to Tyre in contemporary historical sources is in the Tel El Amarna tablets of the 14th century BC. Milky, governor of Tyre, wrote these letters to Pharaoh Akhenaten. Tyre used to be the wealthiest and most powerful coastal city of antiquity, but this great city disappeared in the sea, as we shall see in a moment. This picture was taken from the island, which used to be one kilometer off the mainland of Tyre. Today they are joined. The way it happened is an amazing fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The prophet Ezekiel uses the king of Tyre as a type of Satan and his kingdom. In other words, the literal ruler of Tyre becomes a type or example of the antitypical ruler of this world, the devil. A type is always a smaller reality, helping us to understand a greater reality. While the cruel city of Tyre was at the zenith of her power and wealth and prestige, a prophet by the name of Ezekiel wrote this startling prophecy from Babylon in the year 592 BC. Ezekiel 26 verses 3 and 4 Behold, I will cause many nations to come against thee, and they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. The Phoenicians worshipped Baal, the god of fertility. They had faith in him that he would protect their mighty city. They even sacrificed their little ones to Baal. They also worshipped the patron goddess of sexual love called Ashtoreth. Later on the Greeks called her Aphrodite, the Babylonians called her Ishtar, and they named their main gate after her the Ishtar Gate. And today we have the word Easter from the ancient word Ishtar. When I took a picture of this modern citizen of Tyre, I thought of the potency of the words of the prophecy of Ezekiel. It predicted the impossible, the destruction of the greatest coastal city of antiquity. Let's read on. Ezekiel 26 verse 12 They will plunder your wealth and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw your stones, timber and rubble into the sea. You're looking at an unfinished column from Baalbek called Hajar el Ghibli, the stone of the pregnant woman, quite enormous, weighs 2,000 tons. These ladies thought that the close contact with this pillar might increase their fertility. Well, I cannot tell what the outcome was. No wonder the Phoenicians ignored this prophecy. Who would bother to dump a 2,000 ton pillar into the sea? If the temples and buildings of Baalbek were so enormous, how much greater would the construction of Tyre be? But God's unfailing word said that the city would be dumped into the sea, and we can believe it. And here we see the literal fulfillment of an ancient city that was really dumped into the sea. Please bear in mind that the prophet Ezekiel is using the ruler of Tyre as a type of Lucifer, the great prince of this world. And if we know how ancient Tyre came to its end, it will help us to understand how Satan and his kingdom will one day come to their end. How was this prophecy of the destruction of the wicked Tyre fulfilled? How did God stop them from offering precious human beings to the god of Moloch where they were burned alive? The clay tablets discovered at ancient Babylon tell us that Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to the city of Tyre around about the year 583 BC. The siege lasted some 13 years before he could finally destroy the city. The Phoenicians abandoned the old site and built a new city on the 140-acre island one kilometer off the mainland. Nebuchadnezzar fulfilled only the first part of the prophecy by destroying the city of Tyre on the mainland. The ruins of ancient Tyre, instead of being dumped into the sea, remained there for almost three centuries, challenging the authenticity of Bible prophecy. The prophet Daniel, who was a contemporary of the prophet Ezekiel, predicted that the Medo-Persians would overthrow the Babylonians. This happened in 539 BC. But the ruins of ancient Tyre were still on dry land instead of in the sea. 
But when the great prophetic clock struck, Alexander the Great defeated the Medo-Persian Empire in three successive battles, Chronicus 334, Isis 333, and Arbela or Irbil in 331 BC. The nearby countries were so terrified at the tremendous speed with which he conquered the world that they surrendered even before he reached them. But there was one king who would not surrender. The king of the near Tyre who lived on the island one kilometer offshore. Guess what this great general did? He ordered his soldiers to build him a causeway to the island. And guess how they did it? They dumped the ruins of the ancient Tyre into the sea. In my mind's eye, I can see how those strong Greek soldiers drag the ruins of the ancient city of Tyre into the waters of the Mediterranean Sea. Eventually, they reach the island, and after a battle of seven months, they conquered the rebel. Maya, in his book Ancient History, page 1 to 1, writes Alexander the Great, after a most memorable siege, captured the city of Tyre and reduced it to ruins in BC 332. She never recovered from the blow. The larger part of the site of the once great city is now bare as the top of a rock, a place where a few fishermen who still frequent the spot spread their nets to dry. Every time I visit Tyre during low tide and see the ruins, the words of Ezekiel 26 verse 1 come to my mind. I will make you a bare rock and you will become a place to spread fishing nets. You will never be rebuilt, for I, the Lord, have spoken, declares the Sovereign Lord. What you are seeing right now invites you to place your trust in a sure word of prophecy. This is an aerial view of the modern Tyre. The narrow causeway that Alexander the Great built grew bigger and bigger with the lapse of years. And this is what it looks like after more than 2,000 years. You are looking at a fulfilled prophecy. Before we look at the eschatological message of Tyre, the end time message, let me quickly explain again the concept of types in the Old Testament. For instance, the ancient high priest is a type of Christ, the antitypical heavenly high priest. The blood that the earthly high priest sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant is a type of Christ's life which he offered up to meet the demands of his transgressed law. A type helps us to understand the greater reality, the antitype. Inspiration saw it fit to use earthly objects to help us understand the invisible heavenly realities. In a future lecture, we're going to study about a woman who sits on a scarlet-colored beast with ten horns and seven heads. Eventually, this great harlot, who also sits on water, will be destroyed by the ten horns and they will lament over her. When you read Revelation 17 and 18, you'll discover 24 references to Ezekiel 26, 27 and 28. In other words, if I possess knowledge of the fall of ancient Tyre and its princes, I will also be able to understand the eventual fall of the great apostate religious system called Babylon at the end of time, as well as the ultimate fate of Satan. And now for the greatest revelation of the devil in the Old Testament. I'm going to read from verse 1 of chapter 28, and you will notice how the prophet first speaks to the literal ruler of little Tyre, and then how he switches over to the invisible ruler, the devil, who controlled the prince of Tyre. Ezekiel 28 verses 1 and 2 The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord, Because your heart is proud, and you have said, I am a god, I sit in the seat of the gods, in the heart of the seas, yet you are but a man, and no god, though you consider yourself as wise as a god. It was common practice in those days for a ruler to declare himself to be a god. This was especially true of the pharaohs. Can we expect a repetition of this kind of religious blasphemy at the end of time during the great Babylonian apostasy? Yes, we can. Verses 5-7 to seven. By your great wisdom in trade you have increased your wealth, and your heart has become proud in your wealth, 
Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you consider yourself as wise as a God, therefore, behold, I will bring strangers upon you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. Can we expect a magnificent end-time religious apostate system that will be wealthy and proud and doing business on a worldwide scale? Yes, we can. This is what Revelation 13 tells us. But eventually the supporters of this false religious system will discover that they've been deceived and will destroy the harlot. While you're looking at some of the tombs at Tyre, I'm reading from verses 8 to 10. They shall thrust you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the heart of the seas. Will you still say, I am a God in the presence of those who slay you, though you are but a man, and no God in the hands of those who wound you? You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of foreigners, for I have spoken, says the Lord. This is a typical cultic sculpture. A nude lady with a snake around her. These sensual, as well as other terrible cruel practices, caused the fall of the people in the Prince of Tyre, who thought he was divine. In Revelation 12, we read about the dragon persecuting the woman because she does not worship the way he wants her to worship. It is very important to acquaint oneself with these prophecies concerning the end time. Let's go back to Ezekiel 28 verses 11 and 12. While the prophet saw the character and activities of the literal prince of Tyre in vision, Inspiration lifted the veil between the seen and the unseen. The prophet was permitted to see the invisible yet powerful being, the devil, that the prince of Tyre served. The entire mood of chapter 28 changes. Listen to it. Verses 11 and 12. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre the devil, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This is the greatest revelation of the origin of Satan. His original perfection, his rebellion, his fall, his activities on our planet, and of course his eventual destruction. When he addressed the literal ruler of Tyre in verse 2, he spoke about the prince. But now when he addresses the spiritual ruler of Tyre, he speaks about the king. Verse 13 tells us from whence Lucifer came. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, carnelian, topaz and jasper, chrysolite, beryl and onyx, sapphire, carbuncle and emerald, and wrought in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. Before Lucifer chose the way of self-pride, he was the most beautiful creature ever created. He lived in the presence of his creator. God did not create a devil. Lucifer became one by choice. On top of the Ark of the Covenant in the earthly sanctuary, there were two angels called cherubim who guarded the holy law of God. They represented real angels who respectfully guarded God's law in heaven. Did you know that Lucifer occupied this most solemn and responsible and lofty position in heaven? Let's read verses 14 and 15. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Verse 17 Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. What a tragic story. He lived in the very presence of God. He saw God's perfect character of love. But instead of allowing his own personal beauty to make him humble, he became proud. The next two verses 
Tell us about the destruction of this once beautiful celestial being. Verses 18 and 19. So I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you, and I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. You've come to a horrible end and will be no more. I'm looking forward to the time when the devil will be completely destroyed and everything will revert back to perfection, harmony and peace. In a future lecture from the book of Revelation, we will study about the actual war that was started by Lucifer in heaven. We will study about the great battle between Christ and Satan on Calvary, where he received a deadly wound. We will also look into the battle of Armageddon, where Christ will be the final victor. In the meantime, you and I must guard against the wiles of this dangerous enemy. He is not a myth, but a real being who is all out to destroy us. If ever there was a time to study the scriptures, it is now. If ever there was a time for us to stay close to Christ, it is now. Let me tell you how King Etbal and his daughter Jezebel destroyed Israel spiritually. It is of vital importance because the devil is still using this same successful method to destroy us. An Israelite king by the name of Ahab lived here at Samaria. Edbal, king of Tyre, who was also a priest of Ashtaroth, the goddess of sexual love, lured Ahab into a relationship with his daughter. This was the beginning of the end as far as the king and his people were concerned. The earlier part of the book of Revelation warns against the destroying influence of Jezebel, in other words, her false doctrines. The latter part of Revelation warns against the wine of the false doctrine of the great harlot, and the prophet John borrows his imagery from the Old Testament story of Tyre. While you're looking at some of the symbols of the ancient gods of Phoenicia, let me tell you how their names changed through the ages. Let's ascend these steps and pay a visit to the temple of Jupiter at Baalbek. Six of the original columns still stand in an unbroken row on the south side. They are 22 meters high and more than 2 meters in diameter. How did they get that huge beam on top of these columns? This is what my telephoto lens picked up. When I looked at this, I thought about the zeal with which these people worshipped their gods. When the Phoenician god of Baal disappeared from the scene of history, the Romans revived him and called him Jupiter, and the Greeks called him Zeus. In essence and character, false religions have not changed. Only the names have changed. Archaeologists tell us that Jezebel trained her Baal priests here at Baalbek before bringing them to Samaria. This is the Roman temple of Venus, her Greek name is Aphrodite, and guess what? Her Phoenician name is Ashtoreth. And because she was the patron goddess of sexual love, prostitution as a religious rite was always practiced in these temples. How do we control the evil tendencies of our fallen human natures? As I looked at this huge cornerstone of the Jupiter temple, my thoughts went out to another cornerstone called Jesus Christ. When I rely on him for help and deny myself, I'm safe. But when I build my faith on an emotional and essential kind of religious experience, I may follow in the dangerous footsteps of the worshippers of the heathen religions. This huge pillar was discarded by the builders because of a crack. I told my daughter that the large component of emotion and sensualism destroyed millions of ancient worshippers. May God protect us against the crack of sensualism in our lives and in our worship. May we practice simple trust in Christ and His righteousness. What happened to the sensual worship of Baal that caused the ruin of the ten tribes of Israel? A prophet by the name of Elijah preached the message of Christ our righteousness and destroyed the deception. The only reminder of this destructive cult is the ruined site of Baalbek. On the other hand, the message of salvation through Jesus Christ is well and alive. 
Elijah, who testified here at Samaria, is a type of the end-time Elijahs who will be alive when Jesus comes again. On Mount Carmel, Elijah brought the only sacrifice acceptable to God, the Lamb. End-time Elijahs will also bring just one sacrifice, the Lamb. It's an inspiration to visit the cedars of Lebanon which grow high up on the mountains. Great men like Nebuchadnezzar and Solomon came here to fetch this special kind of wood for their temples and palaces. During one of my visits, I noticed the tragic death of one of these giants. He reminded me of the spiritual death of people. When you die spiritually, you lose all your leaves of kindness. Is there anything one can do to give a dead seed a tree new value? Is there hope for a man or a woman who has died spiritually? Yes, there is. A Lebanese artist by the name of Rudi Rachme decided to create an image of a human being on the dead cedar tree. With a few slight alterations, you see the back of someone who weeps. Let's look at the other side of this trunk to see who it is. With just a few alterations on the dead wood, Rudi Rachma produced the face of a man. This simple work of art made a tremendous difference to this dead tree. He looked at another branch and saw another opportunity to produce this exceptional man. What was the artist going to do about the most ugly and most unreachable branch of this cedar tree? And what can God, the heavenly artist, do for me, the most ugly and most unreachable sinner? The artist, Rudi Rachme, changed the ugly dead branch into the most beautiful symbol of all, Jesus dying on the cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I count but loss, and pour contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did ever such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Since I, who was undone and lost, have pardoned through his name and word, forbid it then that I should boast, save in the cross of Christ my Lord. With the whole realm of nature mine, that were a tribute far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. Are you a dead tree? Has sin destroyed you? God the Father, the master artist, offers to reproduce the image of his Son in your life and in mine. What is your response to his gracious offer? I trust you found this lecture interesting. There are many more interesting places to see and Francois' desire is to tell you all the history and also its significance for today. So make sure that you get the next CD in this series. Please close your eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, give us day by day more faith in your word and help us to fully trust you with our lives because you know what is best for us. In Jesus' name, Amen.